the human immunodeficiency virus is not, in the strictest sense, a form of life. Until it is inside a host's body, it is no more alive than a rock or a stone. It is a protein-coated mass of genetic instructions, 150 times smaller than the white blood cell it attacks. After penetrating, it multiplies until the cell bursts and dies. This continues for years. Cell by cell, the virus destroys its carrier's immune system. The person becomes ill from a series of infections that are progressively serious and rare, and finally fatal. This is AIDS. Being chief of naval operations member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was a piece of cake compared with AIDS. The frustration of not finding a treatment. And the drama of a death in the family. My brother was supposed to die about a month ago. He could only have a miracle. Well, we got it. for the AIDS Quarterly is provided by a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Resources making a difference in the health care of Americans. Good evening, I'm Peter Jennings, and this is the first program in a new series on public television. Four times a year, we're going to use this medium and this place to seek answers and understanding about a subject we know so little about. This winter marks the ninth year of the AIDS epidemic. 45,000 Americans have died as the result of AIDS so far. Another million and a half of our fellow citizens have the AIDS virus. You'll hear most of the experts refer to it as HIV. And although researchers are working on treatments, everything they've seen until now suggests that nearly all of those who have the virus will develop AIDS. Somewhere on our planet, someone becomes infected every minute added up. Let's get one thing clear at the outset. AIDS is a virus. It's not a moral issue. And another thing, we in the media have not always been very helpful to you in understanding AIDS. Take a look at how the media has been covering AIDS in these last eight years. 1981, no one paid much attention when five gay men were diagnosed with a mysterious new disease. By 1982, it was being called the gay plague. Then hemophiliacs fell ill. Remember all those rumors about how AIDS could be spread on the lip of a drinking glass, carried by mosquitoes, shaking hands? Surgical they were all wrong. The event, they encounter AIDS victims and dismiss charges. Actor Rock Hudson has terminal cancer of the liver and he is being tested for AIDS. He's Rock Hudson died in 1985. Two years later, media coverage of AIDS was at an all-time high when half a million people marched on Washington, angry because there was no national policy. And then look what happens. It's astonishing, really. The number of AIDS cases in the U.S. goes on climbing at a frightening rate. And the media coverage? Look at the bottom line. Ironically, those demonstrations outside the White House in 1987 were in part tied to the fact that President Reagan had just established a commission to study the AIDS epidemic. It was dismissed as a political gesture People believe the commission was stacked to produce a report that would not be critical of the administration. In fact, a year later, that very commission brought back a searing report, a catalog of failures and a slate of powerful recommendations. We'd like to take you on a journey now. It is a journey back and forth across the AIDS landscape with the man who wrote this presidential report. It hasn't been easy to reconstruct which will tell you how little attention the media paid at the time. We call it the education of Admiral Watkins. 
In the fall of 1987, the members of President Reagan's commission on the AIDS epidemic prepared for their first look at the virus that causes AIDS. There were eight men and five women. Few of them had any depth of experience, either with the virus or the people sick from it. That included the chairman, James Watkins. I've always been healthy, I've always been fit. My kids, they're all healthy and fit. It's never been an issue with me. I barely knew how to put a Band-Aid on. I didn't like my annual physical examination. I thought they were demeaning. I thought they were the most intrusive kind of uh, examination. I didn't like anything like my doctor. So why put me on a commission? People would ask me, what are your qualifications? I said, I don't know. I didn't put me on here. I'm an American. I'm interested in people. And I believe I can do the managerial work necessary to pull this thing together if you give me a chance, that's all. Admiral Watkins was career Navy. He was a registered Republican, a devout Catholic, and for four years, Chief of Naval Operations. As a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he supported the policy in the military to test for the AIDS virus and reject recruits who were positive. In some quarters, that attitude made him part of the problem. By the time the commission held its first meeting, 25,000 Americans had already died of AIDS. The commission was widely regarded as an empty gesture by the Reagan administration. Too little, too late. How can I have trust in this commission when the homophobia and medical ignorance is well documented and my life will probably not be saved in time for your report to come out. And I'm very sorry that you are an AIDS visitor, an AIDS, a person with AIDS. I'm sorry, person with AIDS. That's why I'm very nervous about There this. wasn't even a common language between the commission and the people with AIDS. I had no idea what troubled waters we were heading into as we embarked on this, and I didn't realize how little I knew. I would estimate, in retrospect, that I had about 10% of the issues surrounded and the 90% was very confused in my mind in June 1987. Before they were through, the Admiral and his commission would listen to hundreds of voices all across the country. They would come face to face with the realities of the epidemic. At a hospice in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, after a month on the job, Admiral Watkins would sit down for the first time and talk to a person with AIDS. Well, I came from my mother's house. Uh -huh. where, is, uh, where, uh, where is that? In Pompano. Her husband left it because I had AIDS. It's a society that is somewhat abhorrent to us. You know, sexual promiscuity comes to the fore, and uh, we don't like that. So why do you want to be sensitive to those individual. We had our own ideological biases in our own minds that were unconnected with the facts surrounding the epidemic and that's dangerous to set national policy on that basis. The commission knew nothing about the epidemic, even less than perhaps what even the general public might know. And the first concept you have to get across to people is that this is an infectious disease that is spread by very well-known mechanisms, sexual transmission, blood or blood products, and mother to child in, in utero uh, during gestation. It, it so happens that the virus was introduced into a population whose sexual activity in some segments of that population was a perfect setup for the spread of a sexually transmitted disease. There is nothing intrinsic about homosexuality that is related to AIDS. In San Francisco, where the gay community had found sexual liberation in the 1970s, thousands of men had been infected before anyone had ever heard of AIDS. By the time the Admiral paid a visit to San Francisco General Hospital, the patient load was enormous. The hospital had struggled with the epidemic for seven years, the first signs of crippling pressure on the public health system. Dr. Paul Volberding had been ministering to AIDS patients since day one. I was impressed that they were most anxious to sit down and talk to patients. All too often, I think, people kind of breeze through here and use it for some political end, and I didn't get that sense with the commission at all. At the bedsides here, the Admiral saw the different faces of AIDS. 
We see people uh, who go from being very intelligent, uh, conversant, friendly uh, people to being shells of, of humans, people who have tumors covering their entire face to the point where uh, they're not recognized by their family and friends. In any number of ways, this is just a, a, a horrible situation. I'm a cancer specialist by training, and this is, you know, give me any cancer um, before you give me AIDS. There are time and time again where somebody says, I was diagnosed with AIDS, my doctor said he didn't want to treat me, my roommate threw me out, my friend stopped coming to visit. My lawyer told me to get another lawyer. Um, and then I went to my clergy person for support, and that person didn't react well at all. Those of us that testified to the commission tried to talk about the HIV epidemic as it relates to other social issues. There has been a consistent effort to try and make it us and them. Let's figure out who those people are and keep them away from us. And if we could just do that, then we'd be safe. I don't know what happens, but I can sit down, you know, at a dinner and I go to take a bite. It just turns, you know. I just mm -hmm. can't I just can't eat it. I don't know what's the matter with me. <laughs> oh, that's okay. You're on some different meds that bother your stomach a little bit too, so yeah. that doesn't help. I don't know why I'm crying. That's okay. I have no idea. The Admiral saw parts of America he had never had occasion to visit before. In the inner cities, he found an epidemic spreading virtually unchecked among the country's more than a million intravenous drug users. In Hell's Kitchen, the commissioners visited St. Clair's Hospital. And here they saw a patient population that has shifted. Two years ago, 70% gay males. Today, 60% IV drug users. As the virus moves through a population which cannot pay for its own care, so many hospitals must struggle to cope. It's putting a tremendous strain on what people try to call a healthcare system, which does not exist. If you look at the way healthcare is provided in this country, taking AIDS out of it, we don't have a cohesive system where we can readily access good, competent outpatient care. If you don't have a private doc, you've got a major problem because you're gonna wind up in an emergency room, you're gonna get thrown into an inpatient unit if you're sick enough. No one's gonna really be following you outside of the hospital. No one's gonna really be concerned with your continuing health status. Uh, when you throw AIDS into it, a disease that demands a great deal of resources and absolute coordination of services, it just comes apart. And that was the basic message that I guess St. Clair's Hospital wanted to impart to the commission and I think they heard us. After only three months, the scope of the epidemic and where it was moving was clear. The reality is that when America has a cold, minority America has pneumonia. In the case of the HIV epidemic, it is double pneumonia. As and the Admiral began to make connections between the AIDS epidemic and so many other problems. Now we have more and more persons who are poor who are getting a disease called AIDS. Who's going to take care of that? Where are those resources going to come from? Even more... Washington, D.C.'s Commissioner of Public Health, Reed Tuxen, spoke for many urban officials. Uh, if this country is serious about trying to solve the IV drug abuse problem or serious about solving the HIV problem, then we must move to that point where we, in fact, can give people treatment on demand. And treatment does work, and people do get better. But in cities like Washington, Tuxen testified, the waiting list for drug treatment is as long as six months. And while you wait, the virus moves on into neighborhoods already overwhelmed with poverty and drug addiction. No drug education here. No AIDS education either. And that means that in many hospitals like New York's Harlem Hospital, which the commission visited, 
more and more sexual partners of IV drug users and their children are sick. Why there hasn't been a, an uproar, I have no idea. Dr. Margaret Haggerty, chief of pediatrics here, would make a lasting impression on the Admiral. Now we have a group of women who are infected, who have infants who are infected. As we have progressed in the epidemic, we have increasing numbers of women who are sick unto death themselves, who have children who are very ill as well. Um, and indeed, we, as we care for them, we have to care for both the mothers and the children. And it, it becomes a, a really quite a tragic situation. Some children who are here for long periods of time because their mothers are dead. And there's no one left to care for them. So they live here. It is increasingly a disease of whole families. Daisy Perez has AIDS. She didn't even know she was infected until her second daughter was born sick. When they were tested for the AIDS virus, both mother and daughter were positive. Look what I did. What I did. I'm She's a beautiful baby. I killed her. And the other one, she is so attached to me, uh, so attached to me of, uh, how is this going to affect her? Because this is, like I said, this is why I'm doing it, you know, it's, it's you know, AIDS isn't like, like a headache, you can't take aspirin and it'll go away. You know, this is, and look what, It's As a matter of fact, it had been six months. Midway through their hearings in half a dozen cities, they talked to almost 400 people. Admiral Watkins listened to the experts and the misinformed. Male blood, and it's in a high risk area, we should have the right to request female blood. Spitting on vegetables. Time and again, he heard from people who themselves had AIDS. But I am haunted by remembering how my husband died and live in dread of the same fate for myself. One day, an AIDS patient who'd been abandoned. The next, a surgeon, frightened of being infected. If I continue doing what I do in the situation that I'm doing it with no more uh, safety than I have now, it is only a question of when I turn positive, not if. We kept stumbling on ethical hurdles all the way through our hearings. During the hearings, the American Medical Association reaffirmed the Hippocratic Oath. That's an amazing event in itself. Why would they have to reaffirm the validity of the Hippocratic Oath when AIDS was involved? But they did. Uh, we found out that maybe a third to a half of doctors in some of our major hospitals, just in this area alone, would not touch an AIDS patient with a 10-foot pole. And yet the Hippocratic Oath said you will treat the afflicted the sick and you take risks in doing it the admiral saw a crisis that was bringing out the worst in some and the best in others i had a friend that i'd sort of lost touch with um who i found out was in the hospital and had been diagnosed with uh, pneumocystis pneumonia and i went to visit him and when i was leaving He thanked me for coming, and then he thanked me for touching him. He actually said, thank you for touching me. And that's happened to me two other times since. I can't even imagine being at a point in my life that I would be so grateful that someone was just touching me, holding my hand, putting their hand on my shoulder, touching my face, that I would have to say the words, thank you for doing that. And 
That's why I'm still doing this. What the Admiral was hearing from witnesses was actually happening in the country. In Anderson County, Tennessee, a 12-year-old hemophiliac boy was infected early on by the AIDS virus as the result of a transfusion. They shouldn't be doing all this, all these parents and stuff. Now, I should put them in cause for it. Don't you think so? It had happened to more than half the country's hemophiliacs. Young Dwayne Mowry young hemophiliac boy who was essentially thrown out of school not by the administration of the school no by the by the parents and this was in the Bible Belt so where are our uh, pastors and our religious on this issue who's to say that this kid might get mad at somebody and go bite them scratch them I mean who's to say this you don't know what's gonna happen it's like putting a loaded gun in this school and just hoping and praying it don't go off. Oh, yeah. Read that, baby. Read that. Trying to kill everybody else. But you're not going to kill mine, baby. Hey! Go to hell. We're not beating certain fundamentally acceptable ethical standards in our country. We're simply not doing it. We're finding mechanisms to work around them and trying to convince ourselves that what we're still doing is ethically sound when in fact it's not. 700 miles away in Florida, three young hemophiliac brothers with the AIDS virus were thrown out of school. We were only allowed to play ground when no other kids were on it. We could go to the library when nobody else was there, pee when nobody else was there. They say we'll bite. No person bite to my sister. She's in school. A year after the Ray family discovered their son's infection, someone burned them out. Dear Mr. President, hi, my name is Richard Gray. I have two brothers. Robert and Randy, we are hemophiliacs. We have missed one year of school already. We don't want to miss any more. We are having a hard time now. My mom and dad can't find a job. We don't have a place to live. If we President Reagan had called the Ray family just to say, I want you to know that we condemn this violence, that America stands behind you, and we will not tolerate discrimination. That would have done a tremendous amount to eliminate that sort of stigma and discrimination. The fact that it wasn't done may not ensure that it will be repeated, but it allows the same conditions and factors which erupted in Florida to reoccur. Mr. Schramm, we've had witnesses... From, from the time Admiral Watkins first joined the commission, he had uh, tried to establish exactly how many people in the country had the AIDS virus. Exclude Americans. To this day, it's a question which has not been answered. Uh, and we're dealing with another one and a half million out there, which is, may or may not be the right number, who are infected, who really ought to be getting tested. He would come to realize that the stigma attached to AIDS made an accurate count impossible. Too many people frightened to reveal they had it meant the epidemic could neither be measured nor stopped. If you have someone who's infected, who may be a bisexual man, and he has sex with three or four women, we don't know the, eff the efficiency of the transmissibility to those women. The only way you know that is to get a handle on who in this country is infected and to trace their sexual partners. Otherwise, we're never going to get a real handle on the epidemic. 59 every life and the virus moved on. In San Francisco, Admiral Watkins visited a street center that counsels runaway children. Do you think it's possible for you to get it? Yeah. Do you? Is yeah. It possible? Uh, it's possible for adults. It's right? possible for anybody, really. Anyone has sex. I wonder, how, how old are you? 15. 15? 17. 17. Some of the first young people who have been infected are the most disenfranchised kids, the street kids. But the big difference for the street kids is it doesn't matter if they know. 
because they're out there just trying to survive. So Dr. Karen Hine talked to the Admiral about kids with AIDS. First, and then considerations about their health come about 20th on the list. In the last 12 months, there was a 114% increase of infection among children under 13. Cases among adolescents doubled. I know you use condoms for these tricks. Yes. Okay. What about boyfriends? Yes. No. Why not? I don't know. I just don't. What? It, that's kind of an ironic situation, is it? Because you're protecting your trick. Because I only have boyfriends when I go home. Where I live. So let's say you have... Well, I'm up here only turn tricks, but I don't have boyfriends up here. We okay. all have examples of adolescents with every known way of getting this virus, including adolescent to adolescent spread. For adolescents, I feel as if we have this year, next year, and that's kind of it. Because once the virus is well established in the adolescent community, how will we ever reverse that? <laughs> I had no idea of the link between what is now defined as the underclass in our nation and AIDS. It was an emotional experience for me because I didn't realize the, the suffering, the agony, the rejection, the denial. We're building, we're hardening that underclass now. We're moving them in separate ways. We've got to save the next generation now. They're our hope. On the day he was to present his report to President Reagan, Admiral Watkins called Harlem Hospital again to talk with Margaret Haggerty. It was sort of a values check. And he asked about one particular child who'd never left the hospital. He had a wonderful smile and a wonderful face, and it was a wonderful little boy, a Christmas child, born on Christmas Day. Um, when the Admiral came, the child was in the intensive care unit in an oxygen tent. Um, but I said, uh, hold your hand out, Admiral. I said to the child, give him five. The kid went this way. He was the, I would say, the epitome of the tragedy. He was sent here, I suppose, for a role to play to get our attention, and he certainly did. These real-world cases make a difference. It's like touching a name at the Vietnam Memorial. Why do we allow all these things to happen and not get stirred up about it? Nashville? Why are we waiting till we're in a crisis situation, social crisis, to get on with these things? I think that we are being tested about some rather core values of all the people uh, and that we are a compact society of uh, folks who in some sense or another care about one another. All of us, that's what the nation in some sense has and that when one group of us is in trouble, the rest of us are in trouble and, and must, must respond. If, that, if I'm right, if that's our values, if those are our values, then how we care for these is a test of that value system. Or we are the largest group of hypocrites that this world has ever seen. I don't believe we are, Frank Franklin. The Admiral's official journey came to an end in June of last year. When he wrote to the President, he used the military language he was so familiar with. The enemy, he said, has captured the early ground, but AIDS must be conquered. I believe that we have a national public health emergency. This is a major issue for the country. It is not just the HIV. It is a health care system that is woefully overburdened. It is a nation that has a specter of drug abuse hanging all over its head, and we haven't dealt with it well. It's a nation that is, frankly, discriminating against other members of our society. I can't tell you the, the passion that's out in this country waiting for the leadership to say, we've got it in hand, let's go. We'll be beyond the rejection, the denial, and the vilification of others and we'll get on to a war against the virus rather than groups and people. Thank you all very much. Do you think that uh, over 61 years you've pretty well cemented your views, but you don't. You're always in a learning process. 
uh, I just wasn't exposed to um, a tougher side of societal life. I've been in a, a closed womb of the military too long. I feel that I learned a great deal about our society and probably softened some of my military views uh, when I'm working on this side of the of society's aisle. Uh, the military was a lot easier. Being chief of naval operations, member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was a piece of cake compared with AIDS. How true. But in both cases, Admiral Watkins knew that he might be preparing for war. This report, which the Admiral gave to President Reagan, George Bush has it now, has 597 recommendations. Among them, anti-discrimination laws to protect people with AIDS. Treatment on demand for all IV drug users. You can't get it AIDS if you don't get it drugs. And what amounts to a complete overhaul of the entire health care system, which it is clear cannot cope with any national health emergency. We'll be back in just a moment. By special arrangement with the AIDS Quarterly, operators at the National AIDS Hotline are standing by to answer questions, to refer you to resources in your area, or to provide additional information. Call toll-free 1-800-342-AIDS. You know, it took scientists almost no time at all to identify the AIDS virus. But how long will we have to wait for the news of a cure? One of the basic obstacles to a vaccine is that the human immunodeficiency virus is just that. It's a human virus. You can infect other animals with the AIDS virus, but they don't get sick. Which is why this white mouse is news. Scientists at Stanford and other research centers have given these mice the cells of a human immune system. And for the first time, scientists can now inject the mice with experimental drugs and vaccines rather than test them on people with AIDS. How to give you some idea of the urgency that people living with AIDS feel about the search for a cure. Across the country, they are saying to the Food and Drug Administration, look, we don't have time to wait for years of testing. Give us whatever you have. Now, it's a lot of pressure on government. Laurie Garrett covers the AIDS crisis for the newspaper Newsday. There is a warehouse near Washington filled with experimental drugs. Its location is secret to keep demonstrators and the desperate away. Only one drug in this warehouse has the full approval of the FDA for treatment of the AIDS virus. That drug is AZT. AZT is helping some people with AIDS live longer, but as Reverend Emmett Watkins has learned, AZT is not perfect. No matter when I take that antibiotic, because the AZT is so close because of the every four hours, I've discovered that uh, it immediately causes vomiting and, and the nausea. It was very toxic for me. I became anemic and uh, started falling asleep on the trading floor. Peter Staley cannot tolerate large doses of AZT, so he's taking a variety of drugs, not all of them legal. Also, the, the illegal drug here in the bag is uh, dextra and sulfate from Japan. I get this on, uh, on the underground market uh, for about $100 a month. This fall, a thousand people surrounded FDA headquarters demanding access to AIDS drugs. Among them was Peter Staley. But we view this as a crisis. Uh, the average life expectancy is two years. The average drug approval process for a drug is seven to ten years. We think things can be sped up. We know things can be sped up. That's what we're working hard to do. And when we get, should I, shall I say, slammed all the time by people on the outside, it, it is hard. Some activists consider Dr. Ellen Cooper public enemy number one. She says someone has to make sure new drugs are safe. Remember thalidomide? If the FDA didn't exist, these same trials would need to be done to demonstrate whether the drugs work or not, what their toxicities are, you know, so, so that we can be able to help physicians treat patients with the disease. 
In fact, just this month, the FDA loosened its restrictions on aerosolized pentamidine, a drug that helps prevent the kind of pneumonia that often kills people with AIDS. How does Reverend Watkins feel about demands that the FDA make available everything in the no, drug I, warehouse? I have mixed emotions. I'm not in full agreement with taking anything that you want or doing anything. Right now, the warehouse is shipping 84 experimental drugs for clinical trials around the country. For people with AIDS, the sight of all these drugs brings hope because a better drug might be here. But it brings frustration because these drugs are still beyond their reach. You may have noticed that we refer quite automatically to an AIDS epidemic. Pandemic, really. It's everywhere now. Which raises the question, how many people really do have AIDS? Our reporter, Charlie Stewart, found it is virtually impossible to get an honest count. Patrick Ireland lives in Kansas City, Missouri. Almost four years ago, he took a blood test which showed that he was infected with the AIDS virus. Soon, he began experiencing some symptoms, but it wasn't until this past year, after several years of being sick, that he finally fit the government definition of an AIDS case. I know I was not considered full-blown AIDS until, I want to say March, but I've been sick for three years um, because I didn't have the right infections. I mean, the infections I had were caused by AIDS, but um, I didn't have the right ones to fall, fall in the government's criteria. The government criteria for AIDS cases is set by the Centers for Disease Control, and it is very specific. An individual must be sick with at least one of a specific set of infections. According to this definition, there are over 85,000 reported cases of AIDS. But Patrick Ireland's doctor says this figure can be very misleading. The AIDS cases are simply the tip of the iceberg. Uh, they only represent a small proportion of the total number of people who are infected with the virus and uh, indeed uh, are carrying the virus and will carry it for the rest of their life. In Kansas City, the iceberg Brewer is referring to would look like this. 531 reported cases of AIDS since 1983. Below it are thousands of people like his patient who have been sick with AIDS-related diseases but don't fit the CDC definition. And below that, thousands more who are infected with the virus but don't yet know it. Gerald Hoff is the chief of communicable diseases for Kansas City. We believe there are somewhere between four and seven thousand infected people in the metropolitan area and yet we only have 500 cases. I think undoubtedly uh, AIDS is not totally reported but it's one of the best reported of all diseases uh, in history. At the CDC, Dr. James Curran says their definition is the most comprehensive. It's not possible to measure all the people infected. These are, are often tabulated um, by health departments, but this is not an accurate measure of the extent of infection. It's not an accurate measure because many people don't know they are carrying the virus and don't get tested. Others go across the state line where test results are not reported and many, like the homeless, simply fall through the cracks. Despite the difficulties measuring, the large number of infected people is cause for concern. When the individuals who are currently infected out there start becoming ill and using the medical system in the community, we are going to have a major problem. And inaccurate reporting can lull the public into complacency. Yeah, until they realize that there's a problem, until we report the accurate numbers, it's not going to hit home with them. And they're not going to be worried about their children. They're not going to be worried about their friends. At the beginning of this first broadcast, we hoped we would accomplish something by sharing with you the conversion of a very public man, Admiral Watkins. We're going to conclude by looking through another window, this time into the life of a very private family. We're grateful to the Paces who live in Salt Lake City because they allowed producer Ofra B. Kale to share with us and with you what it means to have a death in the family.
The idea of family is close to the heart of the Mormon religion. Live a good life here on earth, they believe, without sin, and you will be reunited later with your family in heaven. Joseph and Pauline Pace have been missionaries for their church. He's active in charities. He's been a successful businessman and is the former mayor of San Jose, California, where they raised a family of seven children and 35 grandchildren. From a standpoint of, of patient acceptance. Joe Pace is also a physician. It's total. When I talked with Malcolm, we talked about his ability to be able to control what period of time he had left. Right. His son Malcolm is dying of AIDS. The best scenario for Malcolm is that he goes into the natural sleep by the end of the week and then by the middle of the following week he will take his last breath and be back with our Heavenly Father. They say I should be going unconscious in about oh, four or five days and then death will follow. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it, quite frankly. You're tired? I'm tired. I'm tired of being in hospital rooms. And, uh, but I needed this time from when I came to Salt Lake. I needed that time to basically tie up, tie up loose ends. For Malcolm, the loose ends began in the family. He was born 39 years ago, the fourth of seven children, the youngest son of a strong and sometimes disapproving father. He's always been a very kind, nice, obliging son. But as far as meeting the goals that I had as his father, there were some problems there. He started to do some drinking and then he stopped going to church, and the other boys had not done the things that way. But it was more complicated than that. His closest sister is Nikki. Well, when Malcolm came back from UCLA, he was so torn. Just he developed rapport and relationship with men that he couldn't with women. He felt secure and safe with them. And he kept trying to deny what he was feeling and said, well, something must be wrong. I just have to get my head together. And finally, after he started lo into law school, he finally said, I'm not going to fight this anymore. And he finally started to practice a lifestyle of um, homosexuality. In the Mormon religion, homosexuality is one of the gravest of sins. I kept blaming myself. I didn't know for what, but uh, had I been too protective a mother, or too close a mother, or too... Name it. Had I done it, was it my fault? I thought he was mistaken. I was 100% positive he was wrong. It couldn't be. Not, not Malcolm. I was totally blind. Not my son. Not my son. Malcolm lived a life apart in San Jose. He was a lawyer and an athlete. He traveled widely, and he had a close circle of friends. Malcolm's group of friends have been a tremendous asset and support to him. They've helped him weather through stuff that probably we as other family could not have done. Nikki saw it one way. Dad looked at it differently. I felt that he was going to get AIDS. I really did. Because I was around, as I said, as a doctor, and in the community as far as that aspect of our of San Jose was concerned and the San Francisco being so close by in the bathhouses there was a bathhouse down the street about eight blocks away and uh, every time I'd drive down there go downtown I could I would look to see if my son's car was there I'd sometimes drive down at night to see if his if his car was at a bathhouse now this is it probably graphically gives you some answers to how did I feel about this? So I didn't feel very good. Hey, 
18 months after he was diagnosed with AIDS, Malcolm, who was now living and working in Nevada, became very ill. Then he had an unexpected reprieve. My brother was supposed to die about a month ago. We went down to Reno, and the doctor said he is pre-terminal. That is the classification on his chart. He will be dying very shortly. I've got him tonight. We made contacts with family, with friends, to prepare them that we'd be having a funeral shortly. And lo and behold, you know, when you always say, gosh, if we could only have a miracle, if we could have something happen so he doesn't die. Well, we got it. And that's what we've done for these last three weeks, is we've played out this miracle. Playing out the miracle meant bringing Malcolm back to Salt Lake City to grapple with all the emotions that had separated the family for so long. You know, I love you guys. Don't ever forget it. We're together as a unit. I know. He wanted to come home. His friends understood. There were two pictures hanging in Malcolm's hospital room. One, his family of friends in California who loved him and with whom he shared the last years of his life. The other, of the family into which he was born, the family he so wanted to please, but which he felt he had somehow let down. I didn't want a family. I, my lifestyle was somewhat repugnant to my parents at that time. But he had fought for their approval again and again, in his work and as a son. They're tied together in our family. This, you can't separate them that easily. So, and yes, as a, as a son, yes, I wanted approval. But also in a business setting, yes, I wanted approval. Anybody in particular of the family? The whole family. Probably my father, and my father in particular. Why, do you know? Um, and if you, you're, you're to start okay. talking. It's okay. Um, they've had a lot of difficulties, and one of them being that we came come from a family of high strivers. Um, this is sort of inbred in us as we were young that you always would try to strive for the most. And Malcolm was able to get a law degree, a, a master's in law degree in taxation and different things. And he ended up, in the last couple of years, working for my father. And in it, there have been some difficult times. And Malcolm always wanted his approval that he could be one of those successful members of the family. You know, when I asked him what is the most important thing for him, what do you, what do you think he said? You ask him what's the most important yeah. thing? Yeah, we talked about family. I think he would probably say uh, that love of the family and of the of his brothers and sisters? No, he said his father's approval. His father's approval. See, this, this shows the burden that he's been under all this time. I, I don't try to wiggle out of that. That's, that's, that's very interesting. Now, uh, playing the record back, father's approval you can imagine how it'd be to live all that time not feeling you had your father's approval i've known that for uh, off and on for times that he was fighting to get my approval and it brings tears to his mother because she knew there were periods of time when i was not fair with him and and uh, oh this comments are very interesting very I'm sure very appropriate and a challenge to to myself to be better I I certainly have had some failures in this life thus far did search for my approval for years and years and years. I'm still getting your mail. And I didn't give it to him. And uh, sorting things out. 
that's the way it was. I'm not saying it was right. I did the best I could. And sometimes it wasn't very good. The way that you like to have it down, okay? Yeah. I love my son, I love my religious beliefs, they don't mix. That's called a conflict, when there's no logical solution for your problem. And that's what I've had for many years now, a disaster. I firmly believe in the precepts of my religion but he was my son, is my son, always will be my son. I'm not going to pretend that I've rediscovered uh, the Mormon church. But what, I, what I am, what, what I finally have relented is to accept the fact that there is a God and it may be a Mormon God, it may be a Catholic God, it may be a Jewish God, who knows. But I, uh, I uh, am, am willing to accept that there is a higher, higher deity. And that, that's, that's what I'm accepting. Day by day, they were growing closer. It was a time for my father and mother to be able to really have their son in their arms. I mean, they went through all the traumas thinking they did something wrong. They gave us time to talk about a lot of personal things, a lot of subjects that are really special. And but now that in the last couple of years, they've really come to grips of accepting you as you are and not right. and, and not trying to worry about it's changing. Gone full circle. Thank you for everything you've done. Okay. You have the problems you made me. Really? You'd meet me? Oh, where? At the end of the tunnel later. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll be there. Okay. okay. It was the last afternoon of Malcolm's life, though no one knew it at the time. As usual, the family came and went. Nikki was there. So was her younger sister, Shauna, and Shauna's husband, Dee. Come back, okay? Just Sean and I are here with you like we've always been, been with you, okay? Just go. Uh, uh, you go. Uh, you waiting for Dad to get here? In the late afternoon, his mother came back. They waited, but Malcolm hung on. It was Friday night. Malcolm was fading fast. And we kept saying, Malcolm, let go. Go on. And as much as we tried to coax Malcolm into leaving, Malcolm would not leave this mortal existence without my father there at his side. My father was there less than a minute and a half, and Malcolm finally said, enough's enough, and he passed from this world. And Dad, that is the best tribute with all that has been said and done. The bottom line is, he loved you and wanted your respect and knew at the end that he had it. The pallbearers were Malcolm's friends from California. His father wanted them there. 
I feel comfortable about Malcolm. I feel comfortable. Maybe I should have figured it out long ago. Oh God, our eternal Father, we come together this bright, sunny, wintry day. Two days before the funeral, his father changed the wording of the obituary. From Malcolm Pace died of cancer to Malcolm Pace died of AIDS. Son and friend, Malcolm Edward Pace. hotline are standing by to answer questions, to refer you to resources in your area, or to provide additional information. Call toll-free 1-800-342-AIDS. Salt Lake City and beyond. AIDS has become such a part of our national life. It is an enormous challenge trying to understand it, which is why the AIDS Quarterly will be back in the spring. I'm Peter Jennings. Good night. Funding for the AIDS Quarterly is provided by a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Resources making a difference in the health care of Americans. Produced by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content.